I want to talk to you uh, this evening on the topic that I have not addressed for a very long time and I believe it's very timely and very important and that is how to deal with difficult people biblically or how Jesus dealt with difficult people. Now I think every person who is watching or re-watching has people in their life right now that are difficult. It could be somebody who is not serving the Lord. It could be somebody that you are married to. It could be a children that you are raising or it could be the worker that you are with, a person that you're working for or a person that's working for you or you're currently going through a ministry colleague that is causing uh, pain, that is causing suffering and it's causing your mind to just go kind of all crazy and you're like, man, what do I do in this situation? And so I've went through plenty of that uh, and I am going to go through plenty of that. It's just part of life that we go through uh, stuff like that. Before I share my 10 practical steps that I'm going to get all of them from Jesus on what to do, I want to start from the beginning with two questions that I ask that help me to ponder and gives, gives me a balance to deal with difficult people. When I'm dealing with difficult people, I try to ask myself these two questions. Am I causing the Lord the same pain in some area of my life as this person is causing me right now? Think about that. Secondly, it may be true that I have a difficult person I'm dealing, that I'm dealing with. But am I a difficult person to somebody else right now as well? And is this situation I'm dealing with this person is also a reflection of what somebody else is dealing with me and experiencing me and I don't even realize. So these are just two questions that I want you to ponder that gives you some perspective as well. I have found the first question has helped me. We've had a situation had a situation where uh, we were helping one person, me and my wife were helping one, one person and this person uh, lived with us at one time and it, it got really difficult to deal with this person um, because of you know my desire to help them I felt like was greater than their desire to receive help and then they were not interested in coming to church, they were not interested in coming to anything that had to do with Christ and you know they lived in my house for free and I picked them up pretty much from the streets and so I, I took it very personally, I got very uh, emotional about it, I also got very critical about it to the point where um, I was just upset and I was this close to kick this person out and I was probably right to do so. And as I went to prayer to pray about this and I'm all worked up and I was like, Jesus, you know, like it's time to throw Jonah overboard. Like I'm finding all these scriptural references to justify my feeling to kick this person out. Um, and I felt the Lord put on my heart and He said that, you know, in some areas you're acting just like this. Person is acting to you. You're acting this way to me. And I was like, no way God, I'm so much better. And there were areas the Lord highlighted that Jesus was experiencing me and I was causing same pain to the Lord that this person was causing to me at that time. And man, I broke down, I wept, I cried, I repented and, and I said, Lord, I'm going to keep this person in my house so that I could be reminded never to cause this kind of pain to you. <laughs> the secondly is that I started to examine my own heart and see, am I causing, and is somebody experience of me similar to this person's mind experience of them, meaning am I being as difficult, as stubborn in some areas in dealing maybe with my pastor, in dealing maybe with my wife or some other areas as this person is being with me? And could this be a good reflection moment for me to begin to humble myself and look at things from another perspective? And to finish the story about this person, eventually we sat down I opened up about my uh, frustrations um, and turns out that this person was going through a very, very difficult time emotionally, spiritually and a lot of other areas they lost both of their parents and, um, and that's why they were closed down. They didn't want to do anything, they didn't want to come out of the room, they didn't want to like go to church, they didn't want to talk to us and while they lived in our house you know and ate our food. And so 
we, we cried, we prayed, we forgave each other and we moved on. So now I want to share with you concerning Christ, concerning how Jesus handled very difficult cases that He was having when He was on this earth. The Lord Jesus Christ, unlike us, He was holy, He was perfect. But the relationships He had with people, they were perfect on His end. People did not have perfect relationship with Jesus. And this should comfort us because some of us think that the better I am spiritually, closer I am to God, that means everyone's experience, my experience of everybody, meaning my relationship with everyone is going to be perfect. All of my relationships will be perfect. But you must understand that your maturity is only 50% of your relationships. A lot of other 50% doesn't depend on you, it depends on other people. So let's dive in. The first thing that I want to share with you is this. Jesus prayed beforehand. Before dealing with difficult people, Jesus prayed. Before being betrayed, before being forsaken, before being beaten, Jesus went to pray three times for at least an hour each time. Matthew 26 verse 44. Living a lifestyle of prayer, does not remove people problems but it does give us the grace to deal with people problems in such a way that glorifies God and does not destroy us. Those of us who live in God's presence before, those of us who do not live in God's presence before encountering difficult people tend to get bitter instead of better. They tend to break down encountering difficult, difficult people instead of growing in the grace of God. What prayer does, what having a relationship with God does, it does not remove difficult people. It gives you grace to deal with it in such a way that glorifies God and a lot of times brings redemption in very difficult situations. Jesus prayed three times knowing that around the corner He will be betrayed by one of His disciples. He will be forsaken by the rest of His disciples. He will be falsely accused. He will be beaten. And also we know that part of that was also the plan of redemption will be accomplished. But if we're looking from a human perspective, He will experience relational hell. Hell will break loose. All this pain that will be caused to Jesus will be caused through people. People are the source of the greatest joy. They will be the greatest joy in your life. And people will be the source of the greatest pain in your life. Getting married is going to be a, such a grateful joy. But this person that you're married to will also be the source of your greatest pain. Having children is going to give you a great joy. When those children grow up, those children have a potential of causing you the most pain. So it's not possible to avoid the pain by getting closer to God. What God does by getting closer to Him is He gives us the grace, grace enough to take those challenges head on and in the way that doesn't destroy us and doesn't destroy other people. If you're not prayed up, difficult people are going to destroy you. They could destroy your peace 100%. They could destroy even your walk with God 100%. They could, it, it could hit you. What happened to the disciples? They were not prayed up. So when they entered into this grinder, a lot of them, they denied Christ. They swore they didn't know Jesus. Because this, this relational grinder tests and sifts people very fast. And those of us who don't have a real, authentic relationship with Jesus, we don't make it. The second thing that Jesus did in dealing with difficult people and difficult situations that had to do with people is that Jesus was silent. During His ministry, Jesus would cause people to marvel at His miracles and at His words. In fact, He was speaking as the one that had authority. But when all hell broke loose in relationships, Jesus caused Pilate 
to marvel at his silence, not at his wisdom. See, sometimes we think that during a difficult time or with the difficult person, we have to talk a lot. But the Bible seems to say in James chapter 1 verse 19, to be slow to speak, slow to anger and swift to hear. I believe this is a secret that helps us to deal with difficult situations and difficult people. To keep your anger down, there's one secret. Keep your mouth closed and your ears open. I found so many times instead of attacking a person, jumping to conclusions and instead of letting them know what I really feel about what they did, to listen on why they did what they did, why they're doing what they're doing and actually listen to the end. Not pretend to listen so that you can interject and say, oh yeah, yeah I, 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 I know, I, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Let, let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you. Now that's not listening. But actually listen to understand. Not listen to reply, but listen. And sometimes you would listen and you have nothing to say. For example, Job's friends sat in ashes for seven days in silence. Book of Job would have ended on a positive note in regards to his friends if they would have kept their mouth shut. They had nothing to say. They didn't need to say anything but they did. All those chapters where they started to accuse Job and they, they made Job's pain very difficult because they kept on talking. They kept on talking, they kept on talking, they kept on talking and they had no idea what they were talking about. They didn't represent God faithfully because God rebuked them afterwards. And so this is very difficult for me. I know it's very difficult for a lot of people because your mouth will get you into a lot of trouble and sometimes keeping it closed can get you out of a lot of trouble. It can actually give a breakthrough. If you want to surprise difficult people, it's probably not going to be with your wise answers. Sometimes it will be by the discipline and restraint that you exercise with your silence. Jesus, who is the living Word, who is the Word of God, was silent in front of Pilate. It blew him away. How could he be silent? This is a preacher. He preaches everywhere. He has nothing to say. No, it wasn't that. Jesus wasn't silent because he had nothing to say. It just, it wouldn't matter what he said because Pilate was not a man Jesus wanted to appeal to and Jesus knew this was God's plan had to be accomplished. There are people in our life, no matter what you say, they made up their mind that you are evil. They made up their mind to destroy you. You can, you can grow wings and start glowing and they will say you're witchcraft. If you fail, they will say you're a sinner. They, they have an explanation and a reason. They do not, they can't be convinced. They can't be argued with. And in those situations when you encounter and you know that you're dealing with a very, very difficult person where arguing, defending and fighting is going to get you nowhere. Either listen or just don't speak at all and just put it in God's hands. You know David was dealing with a very difficult person in his life when Absalom took over the throne. And David, instead of defending the throne, he actually left the throne, trusting that God, if he finds pleasure in David, will bring David back. And on the way of, you know, walking barefoot with his man crying, because it was disgraceful, it was, it was shameful for what happened to David. There was a guy who decided to take this opportunity to remind David that he is a bloodthirsty, killing man, that he killed the house of Saul. This was a descendant of Saul's family. He was very upset. He had bitter feelings toward David and he started to, you know, stir up dust, actually physically stirring up dust, stirring dust and then started to throw rocks at David. David's, one of David's guys was like, let me go cut his head off. You know, why is he disrespecting God's anointed? And David let him do that. David didn't stop 
David didn't respond. David didn't react. Eventually, the story got changed. And this is what I've noticed about some critics. When you're down, some difficult people, they will come at you. When God begins to exalt you, some of them will actually change their story and they will apologize. And instead of name calling you and everything, they'll change their story. And that's what the guy did. He came back, he repented, apologized, but then he eventually still paid for his sins through the reign of Solomon. And so this is huge for us. This does not apply to every case. Um, there are cases you need to stand up, you need to speak the truth. But there are cases when we're dealing with certain people, we're honestly fighting, we're um, just, just this contention is not going to bring God glory and will cause us to lose peace. The third thing that I see in Jesus dealing with a very difficult season in his life and difficult people. Number three is Jesus took the beating. Jesus took the beating. Now this may seem at first that I'm advocating, I am not in any way advocating taking physical abuse. I'm not saying that if you're in the house and your husband is physically beating you then take the beating. No, you should call the police and run. If you're a child and you're being physically beaten, we're not talking about discipline or spanking, but you're talking about you're being physically abused by a drunken parent, you need to call police and you need to run. You need to distance yourself as far as possible. What I'm talking about is that Jesus Christ did not return punches, nor did He run from them. He wasn't a pacifist. He was powerful. There is, a, there is a thing within our nature to run from suffering. Some relationships and some difficulties create pain. And it's easy to, dis to walk away from those relationships completely because of our fear of pain. It's easy to just, hey, let me just fire this person. Why? Because, uh, you know, they're just causing me to uh, not uh, be at peace right now. I don't need to practice long suffering if I let go of this. But there are relationships in our life God will use to bring suffering, to allow suffering. And our nature is to avoid suffering at any cost. But the Christian life is not a life void of suffering. It's a life in spite of suffering. In fact, it's a life where suffering is expected. Now again, I am not referring suffering under an abusive husband or an abusive employer or an abusive manipulative controlling pastor and you're in a relationship and you're being made things to, things to do or say that are contrary to the Bible and your, your will is being violated and you're like in a cult. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is that every relationship crisis, even if you take the right decisions and distance yourself, will cause you harm emotionally and pain. Christian life is not trying to avoid that. It's actually embracing it. Jesus Christ, He took that pain. He promised His followers that they will be persecuted. Persecution hurts. Persecution sucks. Being made fun of, being falsely accused, being labeled as something that you are not, it's not easy. It takes a toll on you emotionally, it takes a toll on you mentally. Being sent to prison for something that you didn't do like Joseph, our great-grandparents who suffered for Christ, who were made fun of, kicked out of schools, they embraced that. Because scripturally speaking, there are difficult cases that you can't solve. You have to endure. There is suffering you can't fix. You have to manage. There are relationships and people in your life that right now you can put them through counseling, you can put them through deliverance. And it just won't change the fact that you are hurting. One author said in a book that ministered to me as a leader and he said this, he said that if you are a leader, 
He said, you have to, if you want to be a successful leader, you have to increase your capacity for pain. And I remember first time I read it, I was like, you got to be kidding me. That, that, that just can't be from God. What do you mean increase my capacity from pain? I need to increase my capacity for miracles, signs and wonders and faith. And he says, if you are leading, you will be bleeding. He said, the more people God entrusts to your care, the more you have to have a stiff neck, st stiff back. And he's like, you you're going to have to be strong and you're going to have to learn to endure hardships, lawsuits, accusations, people not being happy with you. And Jesus took, took it head on. Jesus embraced suffering. When I see Jesus, I don't see somebody who was just successful. I see somebody who was successful suffering. The question is not, can you avoid suffering? Because you can't. Can you suffer successfully? Can you suffer successfully? Having that relationship with those people, walking with them, sometimes it's a year or two and you just know there is no way out. But it would really help if you could just remove this relationship completely. But there are just situations where you just can't and you have to carry that pain for some time. And instead of saying, oh, something is wrong with my faith in God, something, I did something wrong, where sometimes it's the person that is doing something wrong and you're going to have to pay the price of carrying that and managing that for some season. Endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is not suffering avoidance, but long suffering. Imagine that. The Holy Spirit will produce the ability to suffer long. Not to avoid suffering, but to suffer long. The fruit of the Spirit is not suffering avoidance, it's long suffering. Meaning you're suffering and He gives you strength to do it for a long time. If every miracle, deliverance, healing, therapy, counseling, Bible study, discipleship removes every opportunity for me to suffer long, how will the Spirit produce the fruit of long suffering? Could it be the situation that you are right now in and definitely, I'm all for God saving children and restoring marriages 100%. But could it be that while you're waiting for that miracle, the Spirit is producing the fruit of suffering long, successfully? What I'm trying to say is this, it's okay to hurt. It's okay to suffer. Jesus did. He took the punches. He drank, he drank the cup of suffering. So drink the cup of suffering in His name. Allow the helper of the Holy, the Holy Spirit to help you, to comfort you. When your comforts have failed, when the comfort of good relationships have failed, lean on the comforter. When maybe the affection that you're supposed to receive from your husband or the affirmation you're supposed to receive from your wife or the perfect family that you were really hoping for but you know kids kind of went wayward or this ministry that you're a part of, you know, things are just like there's a little grinding that's happening with people on the worship team or grinding that's happening with the staff or leadership team or in your group, in your small group that you're a part of and you feel like, man, I don't belong. I, this is a toxic environment. And yeah, sometimes it's, it's a toxic environment and sometimes it's just a very difficult season that you have to endure. Especially if you've been running from one church to another to another and you've noticed that it's chasing you and it's following you, maybe you should, you should, you should just plant yourself and deal with it and get through with it. I've seen God change people when we don't cut them off but we walk with them and we suffer with them and we love them in spite. God changes us and He changes them. But I've seen also some people get upset and they leave and I've seen in some cases you just have to distance yourself and that's what we're going to talk about in just a moment. But first I just really want us to have no fear of suffering and to have a huge capacity for handling pain. Because if you want to be a leader and if you want to have any responsibilities in life, you have to enlarge your capacity to live with pain and live in Christ through His strength and embrace pain and embrace suffering. Number four, Jesus poured out His heart to the Father. Jesus cried out in agony on the cross and questioned the Father's love for Him. This Jesus who walked on water, He commanded the wind and terrifying demons. 
was so vulnerable on the cross during his suffering that he actually cried out these words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This Jesus who heard the words, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This Jesus who walked on water, drove out demons, cleansed leprosy. When He was in the grinder, the weight of sin was upon Him of course. The Father probably turned His back on Him. But as these real human emotions, I love the fact that Jesus didn't try to hide them or pretend they didn't exist. He said, my Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? This teaches me it's okay to have doubts, express fears, complain, even question things when we are hurting. But make sure you open your heart to the right people, not on social media, and open your heart to people who can actually help you to process those feelings properly. Jesus processed His anguish, His agony, His doubts, fears, all of, all of the stuff that normal human emotions, He processed that by crying out to His Heavenly Father. He didn't become bitter. He didn't become resentful. He didn't spew ve venom from His mouth. He didn't curse anybody. He, he released these emotions. He let somebody receive them. And in His case, it was the Father. And I believe that our prayer changes when we get a chance to go to God and, and to begin to release our hearts suffering. Sometimes Psalms are a great place. You, you read about David and like in one Psalm David is like, yeah, praise you God, you know, your goodness. And the second Psalm is like, kill them children, kill them, kill everybody. I'm so mad God, I can't take it anymore. Why did you forsake me? You don't, you don't talk to me God. You're like, you always, like you hate me I think. Or like, and you could, you could read like, David, wow, are you like, are you like okay? And he wasn't. But he verbalized his feelings to God and somehow God gave him strength to overcome them. He verbalized his feelings in songs, in prayers. Don't bottle things up and then snap. Don't bottle things up and then just have a safe place, whether it's in your prayer, whether it's in your journal, whether it's with somebody maybe in a small group where, where you're honest with your fears and your doubts and with your agony, where you can cry where you can break down in a safe place. Jesus did that to the Father on the cross. Number five, now we're getting to the serious stuff. Jesus forgave before they apologized. Jesus forgave before they apologized. Jesus did not wait for them to apologize before He forgave them. Those who hurt Him did not repent. They didn't even think that what they were doing was wrong. Jesus didn't postpone His forgiveness until they would come to their senses and apologize. If you wait for too long to forgive those that are causing you pain, your hurt will turn your heart into bitterness and offense and unforgiveness will do more damage to you than all the bad people have done to you. You will do more damage to you. Why? Because betrayal is what people do to us. Bitterness is what we do to ourselves. If you are hurting, quickly forgive people for your own sake. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26. Because afterwards it's it talks about don't give place to the devil. When you hold on to unforgiveness, when you hold on to pain, your wound gets infected. One of the first things that you learn when you get hurt is you have to disinfect your wound. Um, if you're seeing this right now, a few weeks ago I was riding a bike way too fast, uh, a bicycle. And um, I hit the curb pretty much almost, I kind of a flew, flew from it, 
I had a helmet, the whole nine yards, but I took it with my hand and pretty much slid on the sidewalk. So this part of my shoulder, my hand, and also my knee got all scratched up. I mean, blood everywhere. And, um, you know, I came home and my first thing was not to go, you know, and destroy the bike or take a hammer and break the, the sidewalk. I knew that those were not responsible for my suffering. I made a mistake and I was riding too fast. But for my wound not to become something worse than that, I had to disinfect it, which is painful. I had to clean, clean the wound. And then it started to heal. Within about two days, it started to cover. Then the first layer of skin I ripped off. And now it's pretty much like it doesn't, doesn't hurt anymore. First time it was hurting. Like you, I would touch it, ouch, it would hurt. Now I touch it, like as you can see it on the screen, um, it does not hurt at all. See, that's what happens when you have a scar. A scar is a memory of where the wound was. A scar is a testimony. It's a sign. A wound hurts. I can't talk about it because it hurts. We can't talk about it because I'm going to start hurting. That means it's not healed yet. In order for the wound to heal, it needs to be cleansed, cleansed. And what cleanses the wound is forgiveness. It's when you choose to forgive. Now, does it pinch a little bit when you forgive? Oh yes, because forgiveness sends this thing into your brain. Oh my goodness, I'm letting them get away with it. Oh my goodness, if I don't stay mad at them, that means that they just pretty much ruined my life and they're happy. Because if I stay mad at them, it's somehow punishing them. But it's a lie. When you cleanse your wound, you will get healed. And very soon, you will have a scar. Scars don't hurt. Scars actually help others. Because Jesus came with His scars and He helped Thomas to overcome his doubts. Your scars will be your testimony. Your scars will be your story. You will tell other people to help them overcome their challenges. But you cannot get scars until your wounds get healed. Time doesn't heal wounds. If a wound got infected, time will only make it worse. There's a cleansing that has to happen and if you got wounded, if you got betrayed, if you got hurt, if you got lied to, if you got deceived and you feel like, oh my goodness, I can't trust people anymore, I will not go to church anymore, that's it, I don't trust pastors anymore, I don't trust, I will never get married again. Why? Because I had such a bad experience. Yes, you had a bad experience. I also had a bad experience with my bike. But in fact, I actually went riding the bike again next week after I fell. Why? And I rode in exactly the same place where I fell before. Because I wanted my brain to be reprogrammed that if I do it the right way, I'm not going to fall by God's grace. But of course, you know, sometimes you can get hit, hit by another car. So that's, but in my case, that's not the case. And I don't want to be afraid of riding a bicycle and I'm going to get healed better. And so today, by God's grace, my, you know, my scars are still there. They're, they are lessons for me and they are testimony for somebody else. So when I go through hurtful situations, I learn from them because I get healed. And then I help other people through those because of those situations. God works all things for our good, for those who love Him and for those who are called according to His purpose, according to Romans chapter 8 verse 28. Amen. Is the, if this is helping somebody, could you drop number one in the chat? If you are re-watching this, could you also uh, drop in the chat, I am re-watching this. Let me know if you are still with me and I'm going to share four more things with you. Number six, Jesus responded to the Father. He did not react to people when He was being hurt. 
while hurting, while being not treated good by the people that should have worshipped him. The kings, the Pharisees, including his disciples, as well as that knucklehead Judas. All these people should have worshipped Jesus. He was worthy of it. He was the Son of God. He was God in flesh. They didn't treat him like he deserved to be treated. Sometimes people like, oh, you know, I get, I deserve to be treated better. I'm not as honored as I should be honored. I'm not as recognized as I should be recognized. I'm not being applauded for my good contribution or my good gifts or, you know, like, my, I, I'm, I'm not being honored. And this is hard. Not to react to people but to respond to God. Jesus is on the cross. He cries out with a loud voice. He said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Luke chapter 23 verse 46. Reacting is easy. Responding correctly is harder. Jesus' words and actions were in response to His Father's will and wishes. They were not a reaction to what people were doing to Him. In fact, His own critics said, come down from the cross and save yourself. Mark chapter 15 verse 30 NIV. So what they were challenging Him is to come down from the cross. If he would have reacted to them, he would have come down from the cross and proved to them that he is God. He didn't do that. He did not yield to their mocking, to their demands, because he was focused on making sure his actions, his words were ob in obedience to his Father's will. Respond to the Father don't react to people. Come on, somebody drop that in the chat. Respond to the Father. Don't react to people. May your reaction to people be your response. Meaning, may you respond to the Father in the face of those people. What would God have you do in this situation? What would God have you say in this situation? Would you pause and ponder before you try to prove and defend? Come on somebody, drop that in the chat. Would you pause and ponder before you try to prove and defend? See, to do that, you have to have your eyes on Jesus. Because to react, in order to react, all you have to do is have your eyes on your hurt, on your pain and have your eyes on people. When people and what they're doing is your obsession, you don't see God at that moment. It's so easy to slip up. It's so easy to act out of character. Embarrass the name of Jesus. But when we see Jesus as we're hurting, as we're suffering, as we're, we're saying, Lord, it's not about my comfort, it's not about me, it's about how can you be glorified even in this? How would I respond to you in this situation? Would you have me apologize? Would you have me humble myself, take the form of a bond servant, not grasp for my glory, not grasp for my honor? Would you have me honor somebody else? Would you help me to still honor this person even though they're not honorable? They have not been honoring to me, Lord. Maybe you're a wife and you're in a situation where you're like, no way I'm going to honor my husband. He has not been loving to me. So what you're doing is you're reacting to his lack of love instead of responding to God's Word. Or maybe you're a husband 
you're like, man, my wife, she just ignores my needs. I, I really need this, this particular thing from her. She just does not care. So you know what? Yeah, I'm just going to go and, and, and I'm just going to react to that by, I'm not going to give her what she needs. So guess what we're doing? We're creating a cycle. You dishonor me. I destroy you. You destroy me. Well, I'll show you what I can do. And God is looking from heaven and you're like, what an idiot. God is looking from heaven. He's like, what about me? My son didn't do that. My son didn't give Pharisees a middle finger. My son didn't tell Pharisees and didn't describe to them the temperature of hell. My son didn't curse their children. My son didn't describe how Emperor Titus is going to dash their children in rocks. He forgave them. And honestly, he even ignored them. And he said, Father, into your hands I give you my spirit. They're asking me to come down. And they, they say they'll believe. <laughs> Satan says, if I turn, you know, and I get on my knees, he will give me the keys of the kingdom. They're saying, if I come down, but you're saying for me to die. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to die. And therefore, into your hands, I give my spirit. I'm not going to live my life in reaction. I'm going to live my life in response. It sets you free from the need to perform. It sets you free from the need to please people, but to serve people and to love God. Amen. Are you ready for number seven? This one is hard. Therefore, I do believe that without the help of the Holy Spirit, we can't do it. So number seven is Jesus ministered while suffering. Jesus did not give up on people because people caused him pain. He ministered to the soldier in the garden by healing his ear. He ministered to his mother by arranging her future and well-being. He ministered to the criminal who actually got saved on the cross. So while going through betrayal by people, he served people. He didn't close his heart and say, well, I'm done with humanity. I'm done with people. Honestly, I can't wait to get away from here. And I can't wait to be surrounded by angels again and be worshipped in the glory. He ministered to people. Drop this in the chat. Don't let your pain stop your purpose. Don't let your misery block your ministry. Come on somebody. Let somebody know that in the chat right now. Don't let your current pain stop your purpose. Don't let your misery block your ministry. Paul was in prison. He didn't wait to get out of prison. His writing career, a lot of it was in prison. The epistles we read today and we're like, it blesses me. You know when Paul wrote that, a lot of that was written in prison. Philippines was written in prison. He didn't let the restrictions, the hurt, that people cause them to stop serving them. There's always going to be somebody who is going to go through way deeper situations than what you are experiencing. Find that person and help them. I believe that pain makes us very selfish because pain makes me so focused on how I'm doing and what people have done to me, what they have said and I start feeling bad for myself. I start throwing self-pity party God, why is this happening to me? Why is nobody loving me? Joseph was probably in prison thinking the same thing. Why? My brothers rejected me out of jealousy. Potiphar's wife is completely crazy. She just created a story that I raped her. I, I'm literally, I'm walking in purity and God, I don't deserve this. This is wrong and he's in prison. And this would be a good moment to throw a self-pity party. You know what Joseph does? He ends up running prison and he ends up serving people in prison and the one of the guys that he served in prison actually helped him to escape that prison. One of the best ways to get out from the misery of relationships maybe that you're having right now that is just difficult is honestly stop thinking about what people can do for you and just serve them. You're like, but I'm hurting. You don't understand. I need ministry. Yeah. You also need not to be selfish. 
oh, but I can't serve because I, I can only serve out of my overflow. Yes, that's the ideal. Serve out of the overflow. <laughs> but my friend, if you've been alive for any length of years, you will know one thing. We're not always in the overflow. There are days you're like Abraham and Abimelech is coming to you and says, could you pray for these barren women and you're realizing your own wife is barren. There are days you're like Christ. You're going to have to heal somebody while they're, you're being arrested. There are days you're like the slave girl. Slave girl tells Naaman, says, hey, if you would go and see the prophet, he will heal you of leprosy. Think about it. This God she's preaching about to Naaman is not delivering her from slavery, but he can heal her captor from leprosy. And guess what God did? He healed Naaman. We don't know if God delivered the girl from slavery. It doesn't matter. You know what matters? Is how God can use you. How God can anoint you. How God can empower you for other people while you're hurting. Now I am not in any way saying that if you lost, you know, a loved one, that you should not take a break, you know, and retreat and just receive some ministry. I am not saying that. What I'm saying is that there's too many people who have used their relational suffering as an excuse to stop doing small groups, to stop serving at the church, to stop speaking life and they have went into depression hoping God to get them out of it. Life is like tennis. Those who serve well seldomly lose. You want to be a victor? Being focused on self and your hurt feelings and throwing a self-pity party is not the way. Jesus is the way. And you know what He did? He served in a limited capacity while He suffered. While He suffered. Let that sink in. Somebody dropped it in the chat. Serve while you're suffering. That's how we successfully suffer. The goal is not to successfully avoid suffering. The goal is to successfully suffer. Number eight. Is this helping anybody? If this is helping somebody, drop number one in the chat. Number eight is Jesus received ministry from others. So not only He served others while He was suffering, number eight, is Jesus also received ministry from others while He suffered. A lot of times people are focused during suffering, especially in relationships with people where you're having a situation where there's a lot of pain right now that is happening and if you don't shut down completely the grace that is flowing through you and still minister and still help people, God will send people on the other side of you and they will help you. I love this, the fact that Jesus being the Son of God, He does not stop from receiving ministry. For example, Mary prepared His body by pouring out anointing oil. Angels ministered to Him in the garden. He's the Son of God. He's God Almighty. I mean, why does He need Mary and why does He need angels? Yet, Mary anoints His body. Angels minister to Him in the garden. Someone helps Him to carry the cross. Imagine that. Joseph and Nicodemus helped to take His body down from the cross. Jesus received ministry from others. In your difficult times with people, God will use someone to minister to you. Don't close your heart. The devil will use people to hurt you. God will use people to heal you. Don't give up on people just because you've been hurt by people. Don't give up on people just because you've been betrayed by people. Don't give up on people because they ruined your reputation. Don't give up on pastors because you've met some bad ones. Don't give up on maybe some of you who came out of a broken marriage and your marriage died. And the idea, you're looking at every man and you're looking at them as like some abusive cheater. That's not like that. God will use people 
to heal you the same way the devil has used people to hurt you. But for that to happen, do what Jesus did. Open your heart up to serve others while you're still hurting. And open your heart wide enough that if God sends somebody your way, and right now there are people watching God is using my words and He's using this stream to bring healing to you. Receive that. He may use the words in the scripture. He may use a, a song. He, he, God, God can use anything to bring healing. Have a conversation that somebody will have with you and it will bring healing to you. Amen. Now number nine. Now this, some people I feel like hearing all this need to be reminded about number nine. If you stayed already with me, please hang in here right now for just a few more moments because this is, this is the key. If you're still with me, drop number one in the chat and if you're just tuning in on YouTube, hit thumbs up. Um, we're still streaming to Instagram and to TikTok. Number nine and that is this, Jesus did not associate with Pharisees after His resurrection. I'm going to say that again. Jesus did not have anything close with Pharisees, Pilate and Herod after His resurrection. Up to the cross, He was in the midst of them. They were in His midst. Jesus was around Pharisees. They were around Him up to His cross. After the cross, Jesus did not, listen to this, go back to the Pharisees to prove to them who He was or to seek some sort of reconciliation with them or giving them a second chance. He distanced, him, distanced Himself from them and focused on His close disciples. I see from here a key it's important to set up boundaries with people who do not repent and who are toxic. Come on somebody drop that in the chat. Boundaries. You can't blame difficult people for your unhappiness if you don't distance yourself from them. Forgiving an evil person does not mean you have to be their friend. Forgiveness does not restore trust and does not bring closeness. Yes, it gives you an opportunity for restoration but trust is rebuilt over time. It takes two repentant people to restore trust, not one. Jesus forgave. Pharisees never repented. After the cross, you would think the strategic move would be to go to Pharisees, show himself and say, hey, uh-huh, you're wrong. Bunch of deceived people but God is good. I died for your sins of stupidity as well. So, are you ready to accept me as the Lord and Savior? Yay, nay. Nope didn't give them an option. Actually, Jesus didn't show up in front of them at all. They still carried the idea He never rose from the dead and Jesus did not destroy that idea personally. Yeah, the soldiers came and testified that the rock was removed and everything, the testimony of other people, but Jesus personally did not show up. I wonder why. Forgiveness is a gift and it is given instantly. <laughs> Restoration is not that gift. Don't make yourself miserable by associating again with the same difficult people with whom, whom you have allowed to get close to you and hurt you again and again and again and again. So there's this healthy balance. Forgiving and distancing yourself. Sometimes people are like, oh I have you know forgiven my husband, he's beating me. Okay. Have you called the police? Oh, I can't call the police. Why? I love him. Yes, but what he's doing is illegal. 
It's not only sinful, it's illegal. No, I can't do that. I'm not going to move out of the house. Why? Because, you know, I don't know who's going to provide for me. So I'm going to let him drink, cheat and do all of this stuff. I'm going to create no distance. I'm going to have no boundaries. I'm just going to trust in God. Now, if that is your strong conviction, God bless your soul. But if you're being hurt physically and you're staying in that relationship and you're saying, why am I still being hurt? Let's learn from Jesus. Jesus did not go back to Pilate, Herod and Pharisees after His resurrection. He only went to people that accepted Him. Those who had doubts, He helped them. But He went to people that were repentant. Who grieved the hurt that they caused to Jesus. This is going to help somebody. Don't stay in a relationship that is hurtful to you. If you have forgiven them, move on. Oh, but I'm going to give them a second chance. It's fine if that's what you think you need to do. But if this is a fifth chance and you're not even married and this person has cheated on you and you're heartbroken, you're not heartbroken because they cheated on you. You're heartbroken because you are foolish. Oh, but I love him so much. You're deceived. That's not love. If the person cheated on you already four or five times, something is wrong with you. Why are you keep being drawn to a toxic, hurtful, destroying person? Run from them like from a plague. Distance yourself. Love them from a distance. Forgive them. But don't put yourself in that situation again. When Saul threw a spear at David, David didn't return the spear. He didn't take the spear and say, well, you threw a spear at me? Let me throw you a spear. He, he didn't retaliate. He didn't react. Because in that situation, he responded to God. But I want you to notice, David ran from Saul's presence. And when Saul had a change of heart supposedly and says, Oh David, after David didn't kill him when he had the opportunity, Oh David, come back, you know, I'm just so sorry. Like the, did, did this whole little, you know, like a lot of people who are abusive and people who are very, very negative. They're like, yeah, let's just have everything like we used to have. And David knew, I can't. I can't go back to the palace. Why? Because Saul is not changed. Saul is not repentant. Saul is experiencing regret, not repentance. And when there is no repentance, there can be rec no reconciliation. He honored him. He loved him. He wept at his funeral. But he never got close to him again. Why? Because if you throw spears once, twice, three times, I'm sorry. I can't be close to you. You figure out whatever demon or whatever problem that you got with that spear throwing thing, we can't be very close. Why? Because I can't trust you. Jesus did that. He did not go back to Pharisees. Now God worked through His grace. In book of Acts, we see many Pharisees came to God. Paul came to Jesus. Yeah, he was a Pharisee. So God brought Pharisees back. But I think it's a relationship wisdom. If somebody's throwing spears at you and they are not repentant, walk away. Sarah, if Hagar keeps disrespecting you, let her go. And the angel came to Hagar and told Hagar, go back to your mistress and submit yourself. Humble yourself. You can't have this attitude and be in that house because Sarah is not going to tolerate a bad attitude. So if you are a parent, if you're a spouse, 
and you're allowing all that stuff always happening around you and you're afraid to set up boundaries and you're afraid to create distance. I'm not talking about divorce. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about creating healthy distances. My friend, please hear me loud and clear. You will pay deeply, not because of a difficult person, but because you have no discipline in your life. Is this helping anybody? The last thing to do with difficult people and that is Jesus rose again and so will you. What this means, difficult seasons will come to an end. Difficult people might repent so there is hope at the end of the tunnel. Some will not repent but you will move away or separate. Wounds will get healed and then they will turn into scars. Scars they don't hurt anymore. Scars will become your testimony. In fact you will be able to use them as your testimony to help others. No matter how much hurt and pain you've experienced at the hands of people, your greatest ministry and pleasures will also involve people. You're not alone in your suffering our general Jesus has scars and we are his soldiers. We have them too. Maybe right now you have wounds. Let Jesus heal your wounds and turn them into scars and then he will turn your scars into stars. Amen. I hope this was a blessing to um, a lot of you guys. Amen. I just want to pray if you have questions um, I want to stay for a little bit and answer some questions as well but let's just take a moment and pray first. I really just feel emotional right now and I feel also the presence of Jesus and I feel like God is going to bring just healing to some people who are going through this um, very difficult situation. Maybe you'll be re-watching this years down the road. This prayer is for you. Just place your hand upon your heart. Precious Jesus, You're my Savior. You're our Redeemer. There's healing in You. By Your stripes we were healed. We wounded You and we hurt You with our sin. People have hurt You, belittled You. They didn't honor You and worship You as You deserved to be worshipped. They didn't credit You the glory. They doubted You. They mocked you. They physically beat you. But the way you responded, the way you lived, the way you talked, the way you prayed, the way you served and the way you received ministry, we're not like that Lord. We're the opposite. And so today we submit to you, we yield to you and we say, Jesus, may you live your life through us. May you not only show us an example because Lord we cannot live up to that example. Out of the 10 things I shared Lord, we can't live up to that. But as Paul said that you are his life, we claim that promise that you are our life and that we can do all things through you. We can love through you. We can forgive through you. We can respond to God through you. We can minister in our deepest pain through you and we can receive ministry Lord, I pray for people who got so hurt by the church that they gave up on the church. People who got hurt by ministry that they gave up on ministry. Would you bring healing right now, Lord? I pray that you will receive our confession, God, for those people whose wounds got infected. They neglected their heart. They neglected the hurt that they've been going through. And now they're infected. They're full of bitterness, suspicion constantly doubting everybody, constantly just cautious and are afraid to love, always have reservations. Bring total healing right now Father. Spirit of Jesus, bring restoration right now Lord. I speak your blessing over your people that are watching on this social media platforms who will be re-watching and re-listening down the road, years down the road. 
May the miracle of forgiveness, the forgiveness we offer to others, be ours. May the grace to respond to God instead of react to people be ours. Lord, may the strength to serve by Your grace, not our ability, be ours. May we don't develop thick hearts, hard hearts. May our hearts be soft. May our hearts have baby skin. May our skin be thicker. Maybe we, may we be less offended, less eager for our glory and our ego and our name and more passionate and more in love with Your name. And as long as You are honored and as long as Your name is exalted, help us to embrace the life of long suffering in the areas we have to suffer long. But give us wisdom where we have to walk away from toxic places and toxic people. You said not to stand in a way of sinners, not to, not to sit in the seat of scornful and not to walk with the ungodly. Give us that grace and discernment in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Somebody dropped that in the chat. I receive this prayer. Guys, if this was a blessing to you, if this stream was a blessing to you, let me know that in the chat right now. I want to ask you as well, um, we have a mission, we have a vision at the VSM Ministries and that is we bring the message of Jesus through written content, through podcasts, through videos. We translate books into many languages. As I speak right now, we're, we're, it's being translated to four more languages. Or, or maybe even five. And so uh, we offer this content free of charge um, to all of those places and as well as online, our schools. So I want to invite you that if this was a blessing to you and you're saying, hey, I want to be a blessing today as well. You don't have to do that, but if God puts on your heart and you are financially able, would you consider supporting our ministry either by one-time gift or by becoming a partner so that we can do these things for the glory of God? Our ministry um, is sponsored by donations and we're able to do this and reach all of these things that we're reaching because of people like you. So I, for those of you who are doing it and who have been doing it, thank you from the bottom of my heart. For those of you who have kind of come across but have never prayerfully considered that, would you consider that? And I believe it's going to be a great blessing to the world you will be a great blessing to the world. God has given me a platform. God has opened the doors and you get a chance to partner together. And the other way, I believe that it's going to be also spiritually enriching to your life as well. So consider doing that. Thank you so much for that. Now, um, I'm going to stay for a few minutes. If we have some questions, let's drop them in the chat and we're going to bring them Somebody's asking, why are people with money so evil? Um, I don't think that people with money are so evil. I think that people are evil and they happen to have money. And people who love money tend to be more evil. Because the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. What's the best Christian dating app? I don't know. I've never used any Christian dating apps when I was single. I found my wife on Facebook, so I don't know, maybe try Instagram. But the best uh, place to find a spouse is to honestly, first of all, to be in church. A lot of men of God in the Bible found their spouses at the well. So let me ask you a question. Are you at the right well? Is the well you're by has water? Does it have Holy Spirit? Meaning, are you at the right church? So if not, come to Hungry Gen Internship. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But seriously, do consider that. What spiritual books do you recommend? So I have a video on YouTube where I go through 10 books that I would recommend. Um, I would definitely recommend a book called uh, They Shall Expel Demons by Derek Prince. I really love the book on The Blessed Life by Robert Morris. It deals with giving. I love, I love, love the book by A.W. Tozer, The Pursuit of God. 
I love and I would highly encourage everyone to read Watchmen Ni, The Normal Christian Life. Um, the book on Abide by Andrew Murray. The book on the relationship with the Holy Spirit called Good Morning Holy Spirit by Pastor Benihim. The Fourth Dimension, a book on faith and prayer by David Yonggi Cho. And The Master Plan of Evangelism is a very good book on discipleship. So these are just like some that come from my mind uh, right now. What do I do if my pastor is a Pharisee? What do you do with your if your pastor is a Pharisee? Um, find a pastor that is not a Pharisee. But make sure that you are not a Pharisee. How do you know when to fight pain and sickness or patiently bear it and try to manage it? Now, sickness, physical sickness, I believe you should fight all the time. You should not patiently accept it. Now, sometimes you have to bear it while you're fighting it. I'm not, when I'm talking about suffering today, I am not talking about sickness. Though God gives us grace to endure suffering, uh, even in sickness. But biblically speaking, in James chapter 5, it says, if anybody is sick, call your elders to be prayed for healing. But if you are suffering, you know, then pray. So a suffering that is not sickness type, you know, we have to look for God's wisdom and as well as endure it. Anything that has to do with disease and sickness, we go to war, we fight, we revolt, we resist, we get medical help, apply natural remedies, whatever we need to do, we got to get that thing out. The same way as like with sin, you, you, don't, you don't ask God to help you bear sin, you fight it. And so is with demons. You don't ask God to help you live with demons, you get rid of them. How do you seek for repentance? I believe that repentance starts with conviction that comes from God. And then you make a decision to turn away from whatever that you were doing. You go to the opposite direction. And then there are fruits of that repentance. Like for a prodigal son, he left the pig pen. He actually came to his father and made a confession of brokenness. He didn't come demanding for rights. He didn't come with an entitlement. There was absolutely no entitlement in that. True repentance has fruits that are pleasing to God. How do you know when a long season of suffering needs to come to an end to finally decide it's time to walk away? I cannot give a general answer for, that will apply to every single person. But I would really consult the Lord on that and then somebody that you trust who knows your story really well. Just because I'm not sure what's involved in your season of suffering with people, in different cases there are different answers. Like if you're with the person that is committing adultery, it's different than if you're with the person that is snoring, you know, or if you're with the person that is currently just struggling and they're fighting. You know, it also just there's a lot of components that are involved in that. I think that it would be wise to prayerfully come to the Lord, look at what the Scripture says and then I would bring this to somebody that I know that I trust and give, let them speak into my life as well. Where do I get a shirt like yours? You have to be as amazing as I am. I'm just kidding. Uh, you can get uh, that shirt on online. I think it's uh, savchukstore.com or something like that. And so um, we have it also in our YouTube store or our Instagram or Facebook store. What if I've been married with a difficult person who verbally abuses me? I think that you need to speak to that person. You definitely need to confront that person. You, you shouldn't take that verbal abuse and then you probably need to get marital help. Can you please help me to understand Matthew eleven twenty nine? 29, what yoke or burden would Jesus have? I personally think that the word yoke is the covenant. The reason why is because the Bible says do not be unequally yoked 
refers to the covenant with unbelievers. And I believe that the burden and that is the callings that He would have for us or the purpose that He would have for us. Um, your thoughts on yoga? So I think that in, in originally, you know, yoga, the, the name for yoga and what it means is, is to be yoked, is to be connected. Um, and so I am not practicing yoga. I highly discourage you from practicing yoga. There are people who say, well, you know what, if I just do the stretches, but I don't meditate and anything of that, I still think uh, you, should, you should avoid. There's other stretches that you can do. So much stretches that you can do. Uh, there's so much in yoga that is connected to Eastern religion that is just, it's very difficult to just simply say, no, I'm just going to take the, the, just the physical part and I'm not going to do any of the, the spiritual. You know, I exercise regularly um, and do stretches as well. Maybe not like what they do in yoga, but there are so many other things that you can do that will not involve you uh, stepping on the gray areas and potentially getting a demon. How do, how do walk among people who hurt you in the church? I think that church hurt is pretty normal because there are people there and people are, some people are demonized, some people are just not mature and some people are evil. And so there's, you know, different kinds of people. The ones that have demons need to be delivered. The ones that are evil, like bent on doing evil, you need to, we need to kick them out of the church. And then there's foolish people. They're just dumb people who made dumb, dumb mistakes. They just need to be matured and they need to be brought into discipleship. And so what do you do with church hurt? I think that if you try to focus on not hurting other people first yourself and try to understand the church is a hospital more than it's a museum. The church is more like a fishing place where you're fishing for souls instead of a aquarium of exotic fish. Then it will kind of help you to understand that everybody is hurting in some area and sometimes their hurt bleeds into yours and so have mercy because today as you're extending mercy to somebody that maybe hurt you intentionally or unintentionally, um, tomorrow you will expect mercy for the mistakes you made. So I am pro-church. I love church. I've been hurt by people in the church uh, a lot. I've been since 16 a youth pastor and I'm 36 so it's been 20 years and I can tell you horror stories um, that will make some of you, you know, your blood to boil hot. And I, you know, with what I've experienced with church people. But I also am not perfect. I've done some things in ignorance that caused some people pain. And for that, I am deeply, deeply, deeply regret. And um, I'm not saying anything like illegal or hurt somebody, but you know, words maybe, attitudes. Um, in my immaturity, more zeal than wisdom and have said some stuff and, and I know that I had to own up to that. I had to meet with people, apologize, repent and even in front of the church because I'm a human being and so I see this as a growing, growing opportunity for me as a minister and for people. So that's why I don't give up on the church and I don't give up on people because if I do that, generally give up on people, then I give up on my growth and I give up on Christ and His opportunity to produce fruit of the Spirit. How do you deal with sexual harassment in the church? Se sexually harassment of people in the church. You have to report sexual harassment to the police. And you have to deal, the board has to be involved and you have to confront that head on. And each church should have policies in place that deals with sexual harassment. But a lot of times it involves also legal authorities. Where is your church? Our church, so I don't have a church, Je it belongs to Jesus, but I serve at the church, Hungry Gen Church, along with other pastors and other team. Um, and our church is in Pasco, Washington, Washington State. Pastor Vlad, many have spoken about church hurt from leadership. But what about the other way around? How to show honor and restore relationship with the leader you have hurt and caused pain? I think that if you acknowledge that you have caused pain to that leader and to the pastor and you repent and you meet with them 
and then slowly begin to rebuild trust by not flattering because a lot of people what they do when they felt bad they start flattering their leader and they start saying all kinds of things that are not true and not genuine and it's just going to take some time for relationship to heal and trust to be restored. I believe that if you caused pain to a leader it can be restored. Actually Book of Philemon, if I pronounce them right, is about a slave that ran away from his master and Paul is writing to the master saying accept the slave back as your brother and so it's possible I believe God wants to restore but it does take repentant people. Are you Russian? No, I am Ukrainian and I think because of what's been happening in the last few months you probably know that there's a difference.